I must confess to you that I'm a bundle of different emotions. Part of me would almost rather be anywhere else than right here. Even this morning when I got up, as I do, early, sat down, I made coffee, I start reading the scriptures, but I kept getting distracted. Um, oh, I got an email, or I need to respond to this person. It was clearly avoidance behavior. I almost had to force myself to intervene and to start reading the scriptures that were appointed. The story of the crucifixion of Jesus. I, I don't want to know the price that he had to pay for my sin. I don't know, want to know what Jesus means when he defines love. Greater love has no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. I don't even want to know necessarily Jesus' definition of friendship, or even what he means when he says, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly, because my idea of friendship is camaraderie, but without the cost. My idea of abundant life is a life free of pain and suffering. My idea of love is mutual tenderness, intimacy, companionship, without having the difficulty that inevitably can bring people together into that deep place of intimacy. But you see, Jesus, Jesus has none of this and wants none of this. He is walking out a way that has been prepared for him by his Father. He knows the inevitability. And it's not, you see, a bad ending to a life of love. It is the inevitable consequence of a life that is spoken of sacrifice. Love as sacrifice. Friendship as sacrifice. Even abundant life as sacrifice. If they had been listening, none of the disciples should have been surprised. But you see, that's me. I can't point the finger to them and say, why were you listening? Because I've only heard the gospel, gosh, most of my life. And it's not what I want to hear either. I'd much rather redefine and have life on my terms, friendship on my terms, define love according to my terms. And unfortunately, or it's how it is, I live in a world that is exactly in that very same place. We want to talk about not commitment in suffering, but loyalty that is based on one's feelings. So that if there's offense, you just let the person go home. As a woman said to me, and she really meant it too, when someone offended her, she would just say, I have no time for this. I would just move on. But Jesus comes and keeps coming. He keeps trying to invite me as much as my avoidance behavior would prevail. He will say no, not even to that prevailing, and continue to invite me to Golgotha. And to see on the cross his definition of abundant life, of what love is, of what friendship is, a life prepared for him by his father. You see, that's not even my definition of fatherhood. I'm a dad. I'm a grandfather. It never even occurred to me that when my now grown sons were growing up, that a part of my responsibility as a dad was to prepare my Christian sons for the inevitability of suffering because of their commitments to Jesus Christ. I mean, it never occurred to me 
Persecution is what happens to people who live in other countries. And yet, those implications here are inescapable. Jesus is inviting us in. Mercifully grant, the prayer book says, that we may walk the way of the cross and find it none other than the way of life and peace. And that if we are to walk in faithfulness to Jesus, we look to Jesus as the one who is inviting us into this way of suffering, knowing that the price he paid for our sins is exactly what enables us to both receive the forgiveness and the empowerment is necessary to continue to say yes, no matter what is being asked of us, knowing that we can trust in the goodness of our, our Father for whom this way has been prepared for us. In other words, it's not that somehow Jesus lives this kind of life. So I can live, live this kind of life. In many ways, directly in opposition to the thing that Jesus teaches, because it is quite possible. It's not just Jefferson who did this. You know, he famously cut out all of, all of the places in the New Testament, you see it at Monticello, that have anything to do with the supernatural nature of Jesus. Well, it's very easy for us to do the same. But instead of cutting out the miraculous Jesus, Son of God part, what we want to do is cut out the parts that talk about the suffering of what it means to be a disciple. And out of that, we accept into ourselves a gospel that causes us when things to go badly to ask the question, not, not my will, but thine be done. Oh, Lord, give me the grace to live in it. But instead, we ask the question, what have I done wrong? As if somehow bad things happen because of an act of retribution on God's part, as opposed to him literally using all things to shape me and conform me into the image of his son. And in that great place of deep stability, even in the midst of the worst that is happening, what is being imparted into us is the great truth that Paul says when he says that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him, it says in Psalm 50. So it's not that I come to the cross in admiration, although I do, in awe and in holy fear. Because, but I also come to the cross because, you see, that is my place. That is the place that has been ordained for me. But also for all who call upon the name of the Lord. To know the drops of blood cleansing my soul and out of that being able to stand knowing that by the Holy Spirit he in that crosses ever with me to embrace even the deep places of this world's pain and not somehow see myself by virtue of being in that cross in a kind of special relationship that inures me from life's difficulty, but instead that God is calling me in the midst of life's difficulty to step up and to be there, even in the places of deepest political, social conflict, to stand there and declare the love that will not let us go. And that anything less than that is to use the cross as a place to hide out. Sometimes we need a place to hide out. But it's only temporary. It is only meant to be a place of repression. So that in that place we rediscover again our feelings as it were catch up. And we begin to discover again that he is not true. I will never leave you or forsake you. And so we take a breath. We receive again the great promise of the power of the Holy Spirit. And out we go. I have to tell you, I wish it was not that way. I, I wish I were home with my wife and our oldest granddaughter. And she stands in her little play kitchen and helps her grandmother get ready for Easter dinner. But I'm not there. 
is here. And here is where I belong. We'll show up at home. We'll laugh and love. Play games together. I'll throw my granddaughter in the air and she'll scream in delight. But what is also true is that the arms that throw her into the air are the arms that have been marked by the cross of Jesus Christ. And so even when I throw her in the air, I play with her. That she might be a strong and faithful witness. So come into this discipleship, brothers and sisters. Come into this place where we allow our definitions of love and life and fatherhood, friendship, to be redefined according to the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So that we see with Jesus' eyes and ask him to help us to see it, what it means to walk in the way of the cross and to be able to find that place as none other than the way of life and peace. Because, you see, to enter into that place where we know the cross in here by virtue of what Jesus has done to us is to release through us a level of purpose, a level of capacity, even for suffering, that we never knew imagined. The capacity to be able to not look to my own interests, but to somehow be available for the life of the world. Jesus is like flowing through us in a way that touches the people who are so hungry for it, but often think they are the least deserving. So come. Ignore your fear. Let your world be turned upside down. Find life and peace on his terms, not yours. Let the expansive power of his suffering light a fire within you. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of the cross and find it none other than the way of life and peace. Amen.